They called them Snappers. B and O Crews came up with that name, and it wasn't some nickname they thought was clever. When that side rod broke at speed, all that steel came flailing up through the cab floor. The engineer was done for. Reading crews called them Mother Hubbards, which sounds a little gentler, but the danger was exactly the same. This is mid-1870s in Pennsylvania. John E. Wooten is the superintendent of motive power for the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, and he is looking at these mountains of calm piling up everywhere. This is not coal you can sell. It is anthracite waste, the dust and fine pieces left over after the mines screened out the good stuff. Roughly a fifth of everything that came out of the ground ended up in these piles, and nobody wanted it. Wooten was born in 1823, and he started as an apprentice at Baldwin Locomotive Works at age 14 in 1837. By the time he became general manager of the reading in 1876, he knew locomotives inside and out. He kept looking at all that calm just sitting there in giant piles, completely worthless. Here's what he figured out. You can burn this stuff, but you need a firebox that's absolutely massive. The standard locomotive firebox of the day was long and narrow, maybe 25 or 30 square feet of great area, designed to fit between the frames. Wooten's design was 12 feet long, 8 to 10 feet wide, and over 70 square feet of great area. That was two or three times bigger than anything anyone was building. In 1977, Wooten patented the design. That same year, Rating built the first one in their shops, A460. The thing actually worked. It saved them about $2,000 a year per locomotive, which would be the equivalent of tens of thousands of dollars a year today. Reading started using calm in their stationary boilers first, then moved it to locomotives. By 1883, they had 171 of these Wooten Firebox locomotives running, and they saved $378,000 that year alone. That is real money. The railroad was so proud of this thing, they shipped locomotive P&R 412 all the way to Paris for an international exposition in the late 1870s, where it took home a silver medal. Engineers came from all over Europe to see how the Americans were burning coal waste that everyone else just threw away. That firebox was so wide it would not fit between the locomotive frames. It had to be mounted above the driving wheels. And now you have this massive firebox sitting at the back of the boiler, and there is no room for a cab behind it. Even if there was room, the engineer could not see anything past those enormous firebox shoulders. So they did the only thing they could think of. They moved the cab forward, right over the middle of the boiler, straddling it like a saddle. They put the engineer up there alone. The fireman stays at the back, standing on the tender deck with almost no shelter, exposed. He is shoveling coal through twin fire doors into that 70-square-foot firebox while the whole locomotive is moving at 60 or 70 miles an hour. Winter, summer, rain, it did not matter. Some railroads eventually added little roof panels and side curtains they called anthracite cabs, but most did not bother. The fireman just dealt with it. The engineer is up in that center cab by himself, isolated. He cannot talk to his firemen because they are separated by the entire boiler and firebox. Most of the time, they talk to each other with whistle signals because that firebox and boiler sat right between them. And here is the killer. Those driving rods are spinning right beneath the engineer's cab. If one breaks, all that iron comes straight up through the floor. The B&O Railroad Museum has this on their Central Railroad of New Jersey number 592 display. It says it plain as day. On more than one occasion, a camelback engineer perished in the cab while the oblivious fireman continued to stoke the fire. The fireman had no idea what happened up front. You want to know the twisted part of all this? These locomotives were incredibly fast. The reading ran its boardwalk flyer service from Camden to Atlantic City, 55.5 miles in about 48 minutes on its fastest schedules. That is an average in the high 60s, roughly 69 miles per hour from a dead start to a dead stop. Railway historians figure that put it right up there with the fastest scheduled runs anywhere in the world until the 1930s, when the Great Western Railway started pushing averages into the 80s on runs like Swindon to Paddington. On July 20, 1904, 
The Central Railroad of New Jersey Atlantic Camelback No. 1027 was running from Brigantine Junction to Egg Harbor City. Its documented speed was 115 miles per hour. A year later, there are unofficial claims that CNJ engineers hit 120, maybe even 127 miles per hour on the racetrack, that dead straight section of track between Winslow Junction and Atlantic City. Imagine that. The engineer is sitting in that cab directly over the driving rods. The locomotive is doing 90 plus miles per hour. Those rods are spinning at insane speeds. One breaks, one connecting rod snaps, and it comes straight through the floor. That is why the B&O guys called them snappers. Meanwhile, the fireman had his own nightmare. The Age of Steam Roundhouse Museum describes the fireman scooping coal while standing on a tender deck and being almost completely exposed to the elements. He is trying to keep his balance on a moving platform, shoveling through twin fire doors into that enormous firebox. The grates in the original design were water-cooled, but that did not last long. Maintenance was brutal because the crown sheet sat flat while the roof sheet sloped, which meant the stay bolts were constantly breaking and needing replacement. And then the Erie Railroad decided to take this whole concept and make it even crazier. Erie L1 class. Three locomotives, numbers 2600, 2601, and 2602, built in July 1907 by Alco. These were 0880 mallet articulated locomotives. They were the only articulated camelbacks built anywhere in the world. In 1907, they were the largest locomotives on the planet. They weighed 410,000 pounds, with 94,000 pounds of tractive effort. They were hand-fired, with no mechanical stoker. The railroad writer Angus Sinclair said locomotives this size would dry up all the country's canals, so the Erie crews nicknamed them Angus. They used them as pushers for freight trains climbing Gulf Summit, the Susquehanna Hill grades, and up to Starooka Viaduct. Now think about being the fireman on one of these monsters. You are standing on that tender deck in whatever weather and you are shoveling coal into what is essentially two separate fireboxes because it is an articulated locomotive. No mechanical stoker, just you and your shovel. And the whole time, you are pushing a heavy freight train up a mountain grade. Erie figured out pretty quickly this was not sustainable. In 1921, they rebuilt all three locomotives and converted them to two 882 locomotives with conventional rear cabs. They added mechanical stokers and added superheaters, making them actually practical. They used them as helpers over Starucka Viaduct until the late 1920s. In December 1930, all three were scrapped. The Anthracite Roads loved these Camelback locomotives because they saved too much money to ignore. Central Railroad of New Jersey rostered 111 Mother Hubbard 460 locomotives built between 1900 and 1918. Lehigh Valley had dozens. Lackawanna, Delaware, and Hudson, Lehigh and New England, and Lehigh and Hudson River also used them. Even railroads far outside the anthracite regions tried them, including Union Pacific, Santa Fe, Erie, Baltimore, and Ohio, Maine Central, and Wheeling and Lake Erie. Between 1877 and 1927, almost 3,000 of these locomotives were built. In 1918, the Interstate Commerce Commission, or ICC, told the railroads to stop building them. Officially, the commission discouraged new construction on safety grounds. Nobody has actually found the specific ban order in the ICC records, but the message got through. The design was too dangerous for crews. The last one rolled out of Baldwin in 1927, built for the Lehigh and New England Railroad. Central Railroad of New Jersey Locomotive 774 was the last Camelback to run in regular service in America. It was built by Baldwin in 1913, Class L7 as, with a 460 wheel arrangement. It made its farewell run on July 12, 1954, from Jersey City via Elizabethport down to Freehold Bayhead Junction and Atlantic Highlands. They ran two more fan trips with it in 1955. A photographer caught it at the Jersey City Terminal in March 1956, all cleaned up and shined. Eight days later, they scrapped it. Today, five Camelbacks survive. Central Railroad of New Jersey 442 number 592 is at the Baltimore and Ohio Museum, Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western. 
440 number 952 is at the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis. Reading Company 040 number 1187 is at the Age of Steam Roundhouse in Ohio. Two Baltimore and Ohio 460 Camelbacks survive number 305 at the Baltimore and Ohio Museum in Baltimore, and number 173 at the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis. Think about that. 3,000 locomotives were built. Five survived. Reading Railroad saved $378,000 in a single year burning waste coal. That money was real. The fuel savings were real. And the railroad crews accepted the risk because that is what you did. That was the job. They called them snappers, and everyone knew exactly why. 